do you have a favorite book? And then you went and watched the movie and you thought it was terrible, right? That's what we normally hear, right? Oh, I love the book, but I hated the movie. But in this video, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to talk about the 10 movies that were based on books that were actually good. More importantly, I'm going to focus on 10 movies that were released in this century that were based on books that were quite brilliant and they're worth studying. That's all coming up. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm Samuel Durham, and uh, don't you think it's refreshing to come up with an idea where you think the movie was as good as the book? I wouldn't be doing this video if it hadn't been for Joey from Game of Authors. This is a new channel. Joey is based in Indiana in the United States, and I'm going to put a link to his video and his channel in the description below. What Joey wants us to do is to think about all the 10 books that you love, and then think about the adaptations. So that's what I've done here, but I've done something different because when I first watched Joey's video, I immediately thought this is my kind of thing. So I immediately came up with the list and I realized it came, I came up with about 62 movies that were based on books. And some of the movies that went as far back as the 1930s, and some of them went, to, went quite close to our time. And what I realized was that there is no way I'm going to put, talk about all those movies in one video. So I thought I have to find a way to narrow it down. That's when I thought of this idea. Now, I don't just write stage plays. I've read, So far, I've written four screenplays for feature films and one uh, pilot for a TV show, which won an award. Um, none of the movies have been made, uh, but... I have won prizes and awards for those. Uh, for example, my second uh, screenplay for a feature film, My Outcast State, reached the quarterfinals of the Nickel Screenwriting Contest. This now, this is a contest which is like the World Cup for apprentice screenwriters. It is run by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. This is the same organization that runs the Oscars. Uh, in the past, Jeffrey Eugenides won it. Jeffrey Eugenides then went on to write novels like uh, Virgin Suicides, Middlesex and others. In the 90s, for example, Vince Gilligan reached the semi-finals. He didn't win it. He reached the semi-finals and we know what happened next. Vince Gilligan went on to create one of the greatest TV shows of all time, Breaking Bad. And there are many others who have gone through that route. In 2016, my screenplay, My Outcast State, reached the quarterfinals. It was an amazing moment. Although one shouldn't live by external validations like prizes and awards. For me to reach the quarterfinals with a screenplay about, about China's involvement in the Sri Lankan Civil War, which I pitched uh, My Outcast State as uh, Todd Haynes's Carol meets Denis Villeneuve's Sicario, and, and this was a 110 page uh, feature film, and uh, it was then valued at $80 million. Uh, it was never made, but uh, I got a lot of good feedback, especially from the eight judges, and uh, I mean, there were two judges who even used the word genius, not just for the content, but for the strategies that I used to tell a story that hasn't been told on the world stage, which is about how China got involved near the end of the Sri Lankan war, which became a huge factor in a lot of things, especially the alleged genocide and so on, and the alleged war crimes by both sides. So I have some experience of screenwriting. I would rate screenwriting as the most challenging of the three forms of storytelling that I'm trying to master. So playwriting, novel writing and screenwriting. Because Robert McKee, one of the great um, screenwriting coaches, said that screenwriting is the drill sergeant of writing. It really is really uh, difficult uh, because the main reason is that in, when it comes to playwriting, you, you, uh, the playwright's words are sacred, especially in England. Uh, the producer and the director will have a say, but they won't change that many things without my permission. But, um, and with a novel, most of the time you only have to satisfy the literary agent and the literary editor. But with a screenplay for a feature film or a TV show, so many different people will have input and that makes it a lot more difficult. This is why I really appreciate the adaptations and I study them. So the 10 movies that I came up with 
are from this century because I think they're more relevant to us. If you're an aspiring screenwriter or if you have, if you have a passion for wanting to write screenplays, and I think it's best to study the movies that were successful and the ones who are failures from this decade and or this century. Now, I love the history of cinema. I love uh, reading a lot about the 1930s and 40s and studying movies from that era. But what's really helpful is what, what has been going on recently because success leaves clues and the screenwriters who had to overcome a lot of obstacles in the last five years or 10 years or 20 years, they have a lot more to teach us. That's why I'm focusing on those books and novels. So it would be useful to anyone watching this who also uh, who's an aspiring or apprentice screenwriter. Cheryl Strait's Wild is one of my favorite memoirs of all time. I wanted to put this on this video because most bookish women that I know in the real world, they read this. And so many of those women have said that how this book has changed their lives. But the problem is I haven't come across any men who have read it. I think men should read this because what this is, is that Cheryl Strait, real name Cheryl Nyland, uh, goes on a hiking that lasts three months over the Pacific Crest Trail to save herself. It is a quest for redemption. I know that sounds cliched, but what she has done here is something amazing because it is partly a self-improvement book, ultimately. And it, we go on a journey and it's written in great prose. And what Nick Hornby has done with it is, is turn it into a movie that's just really involving. And I've seen this movie three times now. I've read the screenplay. Uh, Nick Hornby, interestingly enough, was a really important novelist back in the 1990s, one of my favourite English novelists, famous for novels like High Fidelity. If you haven't read that, go and read it. Again, that uh, novel has a great adaptation. Peace with the Spoon is amazing in it. So if you, most women have read it anyway. But if you're a guy, you haven't read Wild by Cheryl Strait, go and read the book, Read the screenplay if you want to, but watch that movie. It is amazing. Gillian Flynn, not Gillian Flynn. She wants to be known as Gillian Flynn. Now, her biggest breakthrough came with Gone Girl. But before that, she had already published two novels, but she was struggling. And this, and now David Finch's adaptation of Gone Girl was brilliant. I don't know. What, you, what did you think of it? I love the novel. I love the adaptation. But I wanted to focus on Dark Places because... This is a novel and the movie adaptation, they, they don't get discussed that much. And I don't want to say too much about the story because it is heartbreaking. All I would say is that in interviews, Gillian Flynn has talked about how much she loves uh, Agatha Christie. Now, I love Agatha Christie, especially for the plotting. But I would say something that might seem sacrilegious, but I think Gillian Flynn is superior to Agatha Christie. Yes, I said it because she's not just brilliant at plotting. But she's also so good at, at prose, commenting on the way we live now and characters that live, the characters that we keep thinking about. For example, I, I occasionally I think about uh, Amy and Nick from Gone Girl, right? And, and she has created, uh, so this is why Dark Places, if you haven't read it, uh, read the novel and then watch the movie. It, it, it should break your heart. I love the non-fiction books of Ben Mesrick, especially The Accidental Billionaires, because I read this in 2010 and I, I didn't think someone could write about a website called Facebook in this way, in a, such a cinematic way. A non-fiction book that really, uh, that is written like a novel in some ways. And uh, I miss Tom Wolfe. He's one of my favorite uh, writers of all time. And the thing about Ben Mesrick is that he is Tom Wolfe for our generation, but without that flamboyant and ostentatious prose that Tom Wolfe had. No one can imitate Tom Wolfe. But Ben, Mes ben Mesrich is so brilliant at giving us this world of uh, Facebook and the creation of this huge phenomenon that now uh, dominates our lives. The thing I love about the adaptation is that it is coming from Aaron Sorkin, one of the greatest screenwriters of this century. And David Fincher has done something amazing with it. It is so involving. I didn't think someone could make a movie about a website or the creation of a website that engaging. And this is a movie that I must have watched over four or five times. One critic called it the Citizen Kane of our generation. And I think if you really love cinema and screenwriting, you know what that critic is talking about. And if you haven't read the book, I don't think that many people have read it. 
do read it. I mean, on BookTube, people complain about the fact that you haven't read many nonfiction books. If you haven't read many of those, read Ben Mestrich, The Accident of Billionaires. Get a copy of Aaron Sorkin's screenplay and then watch the movie. You see how amazing it is. Aaron Sorkin won an Oscar for this and uh, he could have won a lot more awards as well. Lion, originally called A Long Way Home, but co-written by Saru Brealy, is an amazing memoir. It's about a boy who gets separated from his poor parents in India. He gets lost and in the end he gets adopted by a fairly affluent Australian woman. Then as an adult, Saru Brealy tries to find his real mother. I am simplifying the story here, but it is amazing. If you haven't seen the movie i really recommend you read the book and then get uh, luke davis's copy of the screenplay because that screenplay breaks a lot of rules usually you're only supposed to show what's on the screen but luke davis does something different and i seen james cameron do this with aliens which is to tell a story in a novelistic way with a, with a lot more flesh to the bones of the narrative and and but as a result of that, you end up crying or uh, he's playing with a lot of your emotions, which is good, which is what all storytellers should be doing anyway. And and Garth Davis's adaptation is amazing. It reminded me of Spielberg at his best. So if you haven't read the memoir, read it and then try and get a screenplay and watch the movie. Alan Turing, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges is a really challenging biography and I, I'm sure Graham Moore must have had a lot of difficulties trying to adapt it for the big screen. But I read this book many years ago and about a few weeks before I was about to watch the movie, I read Graham Moore's screenplay and it had me in tears. It's a story that's also gripping and the movie, Benedict Cumberbatch, is just superb. He should have won the Oscar. And so if you haven't read uh, this book, try and read it. But more importantly, if you're passionate about screenwriting, go and get that screenplay, read it and then watch the movie. It is a masterclass in screen adaptation. Emma Donoghue's Room was one of the most challenging and heartbreaking novels that I read in the last 10 years. But when I was reading, I was wondering, how could this make a really gripping movie? But then I remember listening to an interview with Emma Donoghue on BBC Radio 4 where she said that she was adapting the novel for the big screen and I thought this is going to be really interesting. And then shortly before watching the movie again, I managed to get hold of the screenplay, read it and I thought, wow, she's done it. The execution is so great. Then I watched the movie by Lenny Abrahamson. Amazing movie. Brie Larson was superb, rightly won the Oscar. So if you haven't read the book, read it and then Walter Isaacson is probably the best biographer of the last 20 years and Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs is one of my favorite biographies of the last 30 years easily uh, but when I was reading that biography I knew that Aaron Sorkin has been given the assignment to adopt it for the big screen and I was thinking how is he going to do it how is he going to come up with this and in interviews Aaron Sorkin has said that he had so much trouble so much headache trying to adapt it trying to find a way i think he spent over a year trying to come up with a structure but then he came up with this amazing idea which is to come up with three different segments uh, to do with three different phases in steve jobs's life and then danny boyle came up with three different strategies of telling that story so as a result what we get is a great biography and an amazing adaptation from aaron sorkin and then the movie is a masterpiece. But great performances by Michael Fassbender and Kate Winslet. There were scenes that really had me in tears. They were that amazing. And Steve Jobs, the screenplay and the movie is, is are one of those uh, things that I go back to regularly, especially before I start a new project because I, it inspires me. And I think if you love uh, great biographies and screenwriting, this is it. You've got all in one title. Steve Jobs. Have you heard of FX Tool or Rob Burns? Before the movie Million Dollar Baby, I had not heard of FX Tool. But Million Dollar Baby, I was interested in that project because one of my favorite screenwriters of all time is Paul Haggis and he was adapting it. And he also won an Oscar for Crash, the movie. So, and I thought, I better get the book. 
and then get the screenplay read, uh, and read it. And the screenplay is amazing. It has lots of reference to the WB Yeats. It's not just that. The, the screenplay is told like a novel. It's really involving. After reading that screenplay, I thought, I don't have to watch the movie now. But then I went and watched the movie. Amazing. To me, it's one of the best movies of all time. Uh, Clint Eastwood, I love Clint Eastwood as a director. So if you haven't seen it, uh, try and try and get the screenplay. If you, if you can't be bothered to read the book, that's all right. But get the screenplay, read it, because it is novelistic. And then watch the movie. And now, I hate boxing. I said it, right? I hate boxing. Uh, even as a man who hates boxing, I just love the story. Hilary Swank is amazing. And she won an Oscar for this. Go and watch it. Jordan Belfort's Wolf of Wall Street is a surprisingly engaging and brilliant book. But this was another case when I thought, how could he be, make a great movie? But it was the job was given to Terence Winter, famous for creating Boardwalk Empire, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Have you seen it? What do you think of that TV show? Now, Terence Winter takes the book and comes up with this amazing screenplay, so pacey. And then Martin Scorsese, probably the greatest movie director alive, comes up with this amazing movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. I love the whole thing. I love the whole journey from the book to the screenplay to the movie. The movie is something, I think I must have seen this movie over five times. And even though it's a long movie, it doesn't feel like it. Now, there is nothing remarkable about the novel Q&A by Vikas Swarup. But what's amazing is what Simon Beaufoy did with it. I read two different drafts of the screenplay and they're both brilliant. And Danny Boyle's movie is truly inspiring. Now, it, it won a lot of Oscars. Now, but Slumdog Millionaire has a lot of personal significance. That's why I rate it so highly. Because this is about a boy uh, from a really poor area of India who wins a huge prize. Now, I spent the first 13 years in the Sri Lankan Civil War and we lived in a really remote part of that area. Now that war was between two ethnic groups, the Sinhalese who are the majority and the Tamils who were in the minority. And we were living in a remote part of uh, the island during the time of war. And when I was 10 years old, I was obsessed with wanting to get on this quiz show, a radio quiz show. We didn't have TV, but we had a radio and uh, I kept pestering my father, but my, but my father kept saying, you know, you're 10 years old, right? There's no way they're going to let you get on it. This is a show that you have to be over 18 to be on it. But it was really popular. So, but I just kept pestering and pestering him. So to shut me up, my father wrote a letter to the producers who are based in Colombo, the capital city, right? Which is dominated by the Sinhalese and the Sinhalese government. So, and we waited for months. We didn't expect anything because, you know, we're the Tamils. Why would we, you know, there was a lot of inferiority complex. You can understand that. Why would they bother with us? But months later, they sent a letter to my father saying that, you know, because I'm 10 years old, I can't go on it. But they were planning to do a recording of the show in Jaffna, which was the spiritual capital city of the Tamils in the northern province. And I was excited. So that day comes along. It was a Saturday. They were going to record the show. And then three weeks later, they were going to broadcast it on national radio. And the, and this quiz show was sponsored by a jewellery company. Uh, so I can win a lot of gold. Now, my mother didn't have much jewellery. Uh, in the Sri Lankan Tamil tradition, uh, the bride is usually given a lot of jewellery. But my mother lost all that. That's a different story. So my goal, my dream was to get her a lot of gold jewellery. But so I I then line up to get on this show to get to be in the audience. But I kept pestering him, pestering my father. So again, he got fed up. So he then approached this guy with a clipboard and I and he told him, uh, you know, about me. So even to this day, I just love that guy. Right. Who had the clipboards. So this guy then went and called the producers. And the producers, they had a chat and they allowed me to go on the show. They probably thought it was a novelty. So I was 10 years old. To cut a long story short, huge auditorium. I'm called onto the stage, right? Even to this day, I can't believe I, I wasn't nervous. I was, I've been dreaming about this, right? So I get on the stage 
and the broadcaster, the host, asked me a lot of questions. The usual question about who are you, you know, the age. As soon as I, when I say 10 years old, they all start laughing, the audience, uh, you know, because for them it was something different because I was, because I'm a Tamil boy in a, you know, in a time of war, just 10 years old. And I can see the audience were on my side. And then, you know, to cut a long story short, guess what happened? I win. I won the whole thing. Even to this day, I can remember the euphoria of the crowds, the audience, the applause. I love that. I didn't want to get off the stage. I was just so much in love of that type of uh, external validation. Now, looking back now, um, I have discussed this episode a lot of many times in therapy. Uh, that's another story. But I love this external validation. I know it's not healthy to live for the applause. But as, t as a 10 year old, I got a taste of that. More importantly, three weeks later, we went back to that house in the remote part of Sri Lanka. I ended up uh, listening to this l broadcast with my mother, my sister and my father. And we had this recorded on this tape, right? I can't play it because the rights are owned by the Sri Lankan Broadcasting Corporation, SLBC. But it's right here. And I'm winning it and how euphoric the crowds were. And, and my mother got the jewellery. Now, many months later... The, the Sri Lankan Civil War took another turn, a really nasty turn. A lot of things happened. We lost our mother. But the amazing thing was she lived to see her 10-year-old boy win this huge prize. And, and I think even to this day, I, I, this is probably one of the, my happiest moments, especially my... Uh, 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 this was one of those turning points in my life. There are many technical reasons why this is a brilliant adaptation and a great movie. Uh, but I would say, but you can understand why Slumdog Millionaire means so much to me. It, I've seen it so many times. It, it's emotional. It's involving. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I suggest you try and get a copy of the screenplay, which is brilliant. But then watch the movie because it is truly inspiring. Great movies are all about emotion. Great stories are all about great emotions. And this is just that. I have to thank Joey at Game of Authors for creating this original tag. Uh, if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have made this video. Uh, Joey is going through some difficulties and challenges with his health. Joey, I sincerely wish you the best. Anyone else, if you're not familiar with Joey's channel, go and uh, look at his videos. Uh, the link to his videos are in the description below. Um, Joey is from Indiana, so he's he loves Theodore Dreiser. I'm interested in his work as well. So he'll be making a lot of videos about Theodore Dreiser and other uh, writers from Indiana. Tag your red. I'm tagging everybody who's watching this video, but particularly the following four booktubers. I'm tagging Hannah Tay, Jasmine at Jasmine's Reads, Berna in Turkey, and also Alan Morton. So what is your favorite book to movie adaptation of all time? Have I changed your view on this? Because usually the cliche way of thinking is to read the book and then complain about the movie not being so good. But the important thing to understand is that they're, they're two different art forms. Novel is one thing, a non-fiction book is one different entity, and the screenwriting process is something completely different, and the movie that we see on the big screen. So we're talking about three different art forms here. Shakespeare in As You Like It says, sweet are the uses of adversity. And one of the themes uh, in this tag is that all the authors who wrote the books, the screenwriters who had to adapt it, and then the directors who had to film it, they all had to overcome different types of adversity. And every single movie that I say is inspiring in so many different ways. For example, the Alan Turing biography that shows the obstacles that he had to overcome and then the obstacles that Graham Moore had to deal with to turn this book into the movie imitation game. And then, of course, then movies like Million Dollar Baby were not easy to get into production. But I want to leave this video with a great passage from Nick Hornby's screenplay for Cheryl Strade's Wild. There's no way to know what makes one thing happen and not another. What leads to what? What destroys what? What causes what to flourish or die or take another course? It took me years to be the woman my mother raised. 
It took me four years, seven months and three days to do it without her. I didn't know where I was going until I got there. I didn't need to reach with my bare hands anymore to know that seeing the fish beneath the surface of the water was enough, that it was everything, my life, like all lives, mysterious, irrevocable and sacred, so very close, so very present, so very belonging to me, how wild it was to let it be. Thank you.